We're here today with Howard Stokel, former CEO of the Wawa chain of convenience stores. Wawa, the Ojibwe word for Canada goose, and the name of the Pennsylvania town where the headquarters are located, is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. Stokel's new book, The Wawa Way, describes the company's history and the secrets to its success. Howard, thanks so much for being with us today. Well, Rachel, thank you for having me here today. So Wawa began its life as a dairy company that actually delivered milk and other products in the Philadelphia area. But as times changed, the business model was threatened. How did the owners decide decide to change the company strategy? Well, that's never an easy decision. And I'd have to say there wasn't a strategic plan or anything of that nature in place. But the fact was that people had less dairy products delivered to their home. And the dairy business really started as a hobby, you know, back at the turn of the century, uh, around 1900, uh, when George Wood moved to Walva, Pennsylvania and bought a dairy up the street. And that was before pasteurization. Uh, and the dairy grew, evolved, was very successful. But as people didn't want as much home delivery, the question was, what do you do with this dairy? Now, the company believed in servant leadership, even though we didn't call it servant leadership at the time, that the people who made the company great, we had to take care of. And Graham Wood, who was the leader of the family and the business at that point, said, how do I preserve these jobs? How do I keep this dairy going? The answer was, let's open retail stores. Rather than sell to other stores and not be certain whether you could sustain the business long term, create your own retail store. He went out to Ohio, worked in a store. He had a friend out there that had convenience stores, came back and convinced the family. And it took some convincing at that time to open the first Wawa store. And it took some convincing to get a bank loan uh, to support that first store. So the rest is history. Here we are 50 years later, and the Walla business has become an endearing and enduring business. Mm -hmm. And in the book, you mentioned that some of Wawa's chief competitors today are McDonald's, Dunkin' Donuts, and ExxonMobil. Now, those are three very different companies with three really distinct markets. How is Wawa able to straddle all three of those successfully? Well, it's interesting. Now, when I think about Wawa, and I spent over 25 years active at Wawa on a full-time basis, you know, I think about Wawa. Here's this company with this funny name from Wawa, Pennsylvania, who has been able to compete with some of the biggest companies in the world. And here in Philadelphia, you know, we have as much market share, if not more market share, than those companies that you mentioned. And the interesting thing is we've stayed true to ourselves. We believe in private ownership. We never want to go public because we want to take a long-term point of view. We believe in sharing ownership with the people who deliver the Wawa brand, our associates. They own 38% of the company. And as I mentioned, we believe in servant leadership. We want other people's dreams to come true. We want to empower other people to achieve their objectives and to help the communities we serve. So we've been able to stay true to ourselves. We haven't taken Wall Street money. Uh, today, we don't really have private equity. I mean, we're owned by a trust fund, uh, the Wood family, and we're owned by our associates and uh, some of the executives in the company. So that's a wonderful world when you work for yourself and you don't have outside influences. And we're able, as I mentioned, to take that long-term point of view. We don't have quarter reports that we have to send to Wall Street. We don't have to worry about our stock price every day, every quarter. You know, if we want to make a major investment in the business, for example, we're opening stores in Florida. That is a long-term investment. You don't make money for the first couple years. Um, and you have to make a major commitment when you go to a new market of that nature. As a privately held company, you can do it if you're with willing to withstand some short-term loss for long-term gain. So we stay true to ourselves, and that's what I think this book is all about, that businesses can stay true to their belief system, yet compete with some of the biggest companies in the world. Now, one of the things that we've always done is cluster stores. People will say, there are Wawa's everywhere here in Philadelphia. You know, I can't drive down Route 30 in New Jersey and not see a Wawa every mile or two. We cluster stores because it makes us bigger than we appear. And even though McDonald's and Starbucks and ExxonMobil are much bigger companies, we appear to be big like they are because we pick and choose where we go. We've never wanted to be a national company. We've never wanted to license. We've never wanted to franchise. We want to be important to the communities that we serve. So we serve the mid-Atlantic communities here in five states, and now we've entered the Florida market uh, last year, uh, and we're happy to say that we're doing very well in Florida. 
Now you mentioned you mentioned going into going into Florida in 2012, and one of the things you write about in the book is that Home Depot and cows yes. played a really big part. Can you describe why? Well, you know, you look for big box retailers, and um, if you have open fields next to these big box retailers, it's a great place to go because you know if you build it, they will come. And the Home Depots and the other big box retailers, they do their homework. They know where the growth is. So that's where we want to be. And as we look for a new market, and every company has to grow to create shareholder value. And in our mid-Atlantic market, there's still room for growth, and we're opening 25 stores a year. But we had the capability financially of opening 50 stores a year. So we needed more dirt. We needed more real estate. We needed more geography. And in Florida, we found open spaces next to big box retailers where we can grow our brand. Uh, and the results are very good. We went to Orlando, opened the first store in SeaWorld, and we figured if we went to Orlando, it created magic for Disney. We hoped it would create magic for Wawa as well. And now you had some interesting things in the book of how people actually lined up around the block to get into Wawa when it opened in Well, Orlando. I was there on that day. And uh, actually, I woke up early that morning. I was so excited. I turned on TV, and there were the local TV stations there at 3, 4 o'clock in the morning doing remotes, and all these people were there. They had camped out, you know, a night before because they wanted to be there when that store opened. And these were people that had relocated from this marketplace in Philadelphia uh, to Orlando, and they they wanted to be with there when their first Wawa store opened up in Orlando. And we had a lot of people that came from Philadelphia down to Orlando to be part of that experience as well. It was quite a happening. It was uh, beyond what we ever expected. It was a tribute to our people. You know, they transported the brand south. And we transported and relocated a lot of our leadership people to Florida because the most important part of our success in a new market is our culture. You know, it's our value system. And if you don't have people who truly understand the value system and can hire people that embody that value system, the Wawa experience wouldn't be the same there as it is here in Philadelphia. And I'm happy to say that the Wawa experience in Florida is every bit what it is here in the mid-Atlantic market where it's been for 50 years. Now, I mean, I guess those people lining up around the block, it kind of is a good example of how people feel, they feel very strongly and very passionately about Wawa's and about many of its products. I mean, it's not just a Wawa, it's my Wawa. Yeah. And I have a friend that one time said, Wawa is my Graceland, <laughs> for example. So I guess, how does that, I mean, how does that figure into your decision making? I mean, for example, to close a store, because it's not just a Wawa, it's somebody's oh. daily Wawa, or to discontinue a product. I mean, what do you, when you think about that, how do you... Well, you know, closing stores is always very difficult because we become part of our customers' lives. You know, we want to fulfill their daily lives by being there for them each and every day, even though it may only be for four or five minutes. And when you come into Wawa for that cup of coffee in the morning or for that snack or for whatever purpose you come to Wawa for, it can be an uplifting experience. You know, I, I always refer to that as the cheers of convenience stores, a place where you're known by name, a place where you have a good experience, and it helps you get through the day. So we're a habit-forming business. And when we do vacate a community to relocate down the street, because we've outgrown the store, it's yesterday's business, and we have to position ourselves for the future, it's tough. And, you know, communities get very concerned when we do it. But they adjust to it because they find the other store is not too far down the street, and the other store is bigger, has more throughput, has more to offer, has gasoline. And if you don't constantly reinvent yourself, you don't succeed. And had we not reinvented ourselves multiple times throughout our history, we wouldn't be here today. I remember, you know, when I joined the company back in 1987, we were building small stores, 3,000 square foot stores with 20 parking places. We didn't have gas. We didn't have a lot of food service to go. Yes, we had deli and produce. Many of our products made it home to the kitchen. But today, most of our products are consumed in the car. We fuel people and we fuel cars. Uh, and we fill people with cash because we have no surcharge ATM machines as well. So we're there for customers on a daily basis, and we become habit-forming. We become part of their daily routine and their lives, and that's what makes the Wawa brand so special. Now, um, in the book, you also write about how you mentioned um, having gas and then also coffee, I guess, is another big thing. Now, Wawa is actually kind of ahead of its time in introducing gas pumps and then also coffee, but initially it failed and then succeeded the second time around. I guess, what did you learn from those experiences? Well, you know, we always talk about our failures because we learn from our failures. Just because something doesn't work the first time 
doesn't mean it's not going to work down the road. For example, 20 years ago, I went to uh, Seattle uh, when Starbucks was really taking Seattle by storm, studied the espresso market. Uh, and we came back and in about 15 stores opened espresso bars. It didn't work. We were ahead of our time uh, for Wawa. Our success isn't being on the bleeding edge. It's mainstreaming popular concepts. And we have to wait for things to become popular before they work at Wawa. We were in the gas business at one point, way back when in the 1970s. But we had small lots with two or three gas pumps, and we got out of the gas business. But then we re-entered the gas business um, in um, the 1990s. So you just never know. You can never give up. Just because you failed once doesn't mean you're not going to succeed uh, the second time around. So many of our greatest successes came out of disappointments and failures. You learn, you move on. So we constantly talk about failures, what we can learn from failures, and that doesn't stop us from doing it a second or third time. We've come back with, you know, especially hot beverages, and now they're very successful in our stores. Gas we came back with, and now we have a 1.7% market share of all gas sold in the United States. And we only have stores in six states. Now, um, another thing, I had read a 2011 story in Philadelphia Magazine, I think it was called It's a Wawa World, and yes. one of the things that was really fascinating about that is just talking about, they talked a lot about how the store is really designed for maximum efficient instancy. I think you mentioned getting yes. people in and out in four or five minutes. Can you explain how this is done and kind of the research that goes into this and the changes that have been instituted as a result? Well, customers are time starved. No one has excess time today, and we are a convenience retailer uh, with high quality food. So we do, do need to get customers in and out quickly. So we have an operations engineering function and they study everything. They study the flow of the parking lot. They study the flow of traffic inside the store. They study the, the layout of coffee. You know, going back in time, we had one coffee location where coffee was brewed, uh, where it was in canisters and coffee was poured into the customer's cup. Now we've separated it into multiple locations because we needed the throughput. We study how long it takes a, uh, you know, a customer to pour a cup of coffee, how many creamers, how many sugars, how we can make the layout more efficient, because speed is everything. We want to save our customers time. We want to give them a quality experience. On the other hand, you know, our economic engine is getting more customers through the store. And if we're slow, we're going to get less customers through the store. We love customers four or five minutes at a time because we like to spread our love to the next group of customers that come in. We're in a low ticket business. You know, it's a $5 ticket business at best. So if you don't have a lot of customers, you can't make money and you can't reinvest in the business and give back to the communities. Now, um, one thing I noticed about some of the new designs of the stores is they've kind of gotten rid of the circular cash wrap in favor of more of a grocery store style one. What do you have any insight about like why that was done? Well, you of? know, we're upgrading our image. You know, our food is high quality food. It's really restaurant quality food to go. And we want to showcase that food. So when you walk into our newer stores today, you don't see a big checkout counter or a service center. You see the kitchen. You see hot beverages. You see cold beverages. You see the Wawa Express case with green salads and cut fruits and veggie snacks. That's what we want to be known for. That's what we want to stand for. So today, you know, we have really changed the ambience of our stores to be more appealing from a quality and a food service standpoint. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. You know, appetite appeal is very important when you walk into that store. We still, still sell many of the products we used to sell, but we've re-merchandised the store to focus on what really is important to the business strategically, uh, and that's food service. Now, how do you, I guess, how do you road test new food products? Like, how do you figure out that there's a big demand, for example, for fresh cut mango? in like the fresh food area? Like how do you road test to, to well, see if things will catch we're up? we're always testing new products. And again, we're not on the leading edge. You know, we mainstream what customers want. So we do focus groups, we do quantitative research, we do qualitative research. We certainly look at what our competitors are, you know, doing uh, and we test. And, you know, we'll find out what the customers want and what the customers don't want. Most of the products that we have are frequent, they're immediate, they're quick, they're easy and they're appetizing. So they have to kind of fit that filter to find their way into a Wawa store. Uh, and we want to simplify our customers' lives, so we have to be able to deliver it quickly. Uh, so some things we try, doesn't work, we'll discontinue. Other things we do on a small basis in a group of stores, then we expand it, and if it succeeds, we take it out to the entire chain.
Now, what has been, I guess, first of all, the most su surprising success, and then maybe what a surprising failure in terms of that? Well, I think when I look back in time, we went through a difficult time in the late 80s and early 90s called the dark days. The economy was tough, and at that time, convenience retailers were charging a premium for convenience. Uh, and competitors were opening additional hours, supermarkets and drugstores, and people didn't want to pay a premium. Uh, for convenience. So we had to rethink our business. And we rethought the business by one, lowering prices, our major commodities, which worked very well for us. But at the time, we didn't have as much credibility in our own food service brand as we do today. So we thought we needed the brands of others. And we actually co-branded with Dunkin' Donuts, and we had Dunkin' Donuts in all of our stores. Uh, we had Krispy Kreme in stores where we didn't have Dunkin' Donuts. We had Taco Bells in probably 150 stores, Pizza Huts in some stores, and that failed miserably because customers said, we want your product. Our associates said, we don't want to make the products of others. We want to make Wawa products. So even though we did some initial research and it was a little bit hazy as to whether or not these concepts would work, there was a trend in the convenience store industry to co-brand. That was a miserable failure. We took every Taco Bell out, we took every Pizza Hut out, we took every Dunkin' Donut unit out. But what it taught us was to think like a major retailer and a national brand. Because if you have those brands in your stores, you've got to make your brand, whether it be coffee or hoagies or food service, come up to a higher level. Those failures, those disappointments, put us on an entirely different journey to focus on the Wawa brand. And I always said I wanted to be the Trader Joe's of the convenience store industry and be known for Wawa branded products. And that's the journey that we've been on. So that's been a big disappointment. It was a disappointment at the time, but it became a big success. You know, gasoline, as I mentioned, the first time around it was a, you know, a, a failure, did not work. But we came back, and now we have the number one market share in all those counties uh, where we have stores for gasoline because we thought big, big sites, big gas, and we priced it to save the, comp the customer's money. Now, has there been a particular product that just the level of public obsession with it has kind of come as a surprise to you? Like the, the reading in the book about how people feel so passionately about the passionately about the iced tea was well, a little bit of a surprise. Well, iced tea has an incredible uh, college kids. <laughs> Uh, it's college students love iced tea, uh, and they ask for the iced tea. The first thing they come home, or parents in some cases, ship them iced tea. You know, one of the smaller ones that people have an affinity to is the turkey gobbler. You know, the turkey gobbler hoagie, the turkey gobbler bowl uh, during the fall season. Turkey, mashed potatoes, stuffing, and gravy. Where else do you get that? I mean, you don't go to McDonald's or Burger King or Starbucks or Dunkin' and get something of that nature. Comfort food. Uh, that makes you feel good. And that one has always surprised me in terms of how customers have such a strong affinity to the turkey gobbler. Mm -hmm. And now I had recently, I recently actually heard a talk by a vice president at Walgreens. He was talking about their efforts to redesign some of the Dwayne Reed pharmacies in New York City. And one of the things that he said that really struck me was, is that it doesn't matter how much you redesign something if, the, if your employees aren't on board, if the customer service doesn't match the sort of visual experience that someone's getting. How do you think that this translates at Wawa? Well, our associates are our brand ambassadors. Our associates make us a living brand. And really, customers come in, yes, they want a cup of coffee, they want a hoagie, uh, they want the necessities to get through the day. But they come in for that Wawa experience. That cup of coffee is more than a cup of coffee. It's the interaction with the coffee host or hostess. It's that good morning from the person behind the register. It's the acknowledgement from the store manager. It's when you come into a Wawa, people always hold the door for you. And people say, well, who designed that system? Well, we didn't design the system. It's just the frame of mind that people are in when they come into a Wawa store. So it's really our people that make that experience so unique. Now, how um, I know that you have a whole training area at your headquarters. Yes. Well, how does that figure into it as well? Well, number one, we hire for our values. You know, when I look at the people that work at Wawa, they come from all walks of life. They have very different backgrounds. But the one thing they have in common, they share our value system. And when I ask people, why did you apply for a job at Wawa? It's your values. We read about them, you know, on your website. Uh, we talk to your associates about it. And the six values are the glue that keep the company together. So we hire for the values and we train for the values. Uh, and we have Wawa University. 
uh, and we have orientation programs, uh, and we have a servant leadership program that all leaders of the business must go through if they're going to run a store. The most important people in the company are the people in the stores. They deliver the living brand. Those, you know, 650 store managers are the essence of Wawa, and their people are what make this company so special, and it's focusing on them. Harvard Business Review did a study uh, about 10 years ago, and they talked about, you know, the convenience store industry is not an exciting industry, not like department stores or Nordstrom's. And in Nordstrom's, you expect great service, but you don't expect it when you go into a convenience retailer. And they said there were a few companies like Quick Trip out of Tulsa uh, and Wawa where you get that unique customer experience, and they said it all comes down to the people and their investment in training and their investment in belief in the people that deliver that Wawa brand experience. Now, has it also been a, t a case of, I mean, I've gone, like in Wawa's, you also, it seems like there's never too few employees at a Wawa. There's always a ton of people working either behind the cash wrap or behind the um, sandwich preparation area. I mean, is that part of it too, as far as keeping staffing ample in terms of the stores? Or? Well, we have automated you know, scheduling systems and we you know, project what demand is going to be. And in our business, if we're gonna simplify your life, we have to get people in and out of the store as customers very quickly. So you've gotta have the right number of people servicing the store behind the food service area, at the checkout core, maintaining the gas island, replenishing the shelves. Uh, because if we don't, if things slow down, then we haven't fulfilled our obligation to you. Unlike a lot of convenience retailers, we do high volume, so we can support a much larger staff in the store. You go into some convenience stores, there are one or two people on duty. At Wawa, you go into a store during the day, you'll see 12, 15, 18 people on duty. The store on the campus here, 38th and Spruce, it is a beehive of activity, and you'll go in there at noon, and there'll be 15, 20 people plus uh, delighting their customers. Great. And in the next few years, what do you see as the biggest opportunities and then also the biggest threats for Wawa? Well, in terms of the biggest threats, some of the commodities uh, are not growing. You know, we've always sold a lot of tobacco. Tobacco's a declining category. Uh, so that's going to be far less important than what it's been in the past. Even gas today is declining. Uh, people are driving less. People are using less gallons. Cars are becoming much more fuel efficient. And you hear about electric cars and alternative energies. So gas isn't necessarily going to be a driving business the way it has been in the past. So the biggest challenge are to replace these commodities. Uh, and our action is to grow the food service business. Uh, and that's why you walk into the new Wawa's today, you look at our stores in Florida, they look like restaurants. They're restaurants to go with gasoline. And normally, you don't think of a gasoline retailer having great quality food, nor do you think of a restaurant selling gasoline. That's what makes Wawa so unique. It's like a blue ocean strategy. It's what others don't do. Combining daily necessities, like fuel, with quality food that you would find in a fast casual restaurant. So growing that food service business, competing with big global companies like McDonald's, but also those emerging companies like Panera um, and like Starbucks and other people in the fast casual space. That's our challenge. You know, our business never sleeps. It's 365, seven by 24. We're a convenience retailer, we're a fuel retailer, we're a food service retailer, we're high volume uh, uh, in all three. Keeping that momentum going is always a challenge. Howard, thanks so much for being with us today. Well, my pleasure. Thank you for having me, Rachel.